amazing. Hey, it's so good to see everybody in the house of the Lord today. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church, who we love so much. Come on, give it up for yourselves. Because Lifeline, you are awesome, and we love you so much. I believe this from the bottom of my heart. I say this every single week, so don't tune me out. I, I mean it. I mean it every single time. I believe God has a message of hope, encouragement, and love that he wants to speak into your life today. You're not here by accident. Not at all. That maybe someone invited you today. Maybe it feels a little random. Maybe you saw a Facebook post. Maybe, 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 maybe. No, maybe's about it. God has been leading you to this moment. And I believe it's because God wants something. He has something he wants to share with you. That it's not my words that are going to ring through. It's his words through me that are ring through to you in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen with me today. Amen, amen means I believe it and let it be done. So that's why we say that. So um, before we get started today, I just want to take a moment to say happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I really appreciate everything that you're doing for your family. I appreciate everything that you're doing in this community. I want to say happy Father's Day to everybody tuning in online. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being such a good father. And we come, it's amazing to me when I'm thinking about Father's Day for church, I'm thinking about my father in heaven. He's, he's the father I'm giving glory and credit to right now because my, my earthly father, he was just fine. But you know what? When I, when I met my heavenly father and when I realized everything that he had done for me, when I realized how patient he has always been with me, how he was always drawing me back into relationship with himself, man, happy Father's Day to us all. Isn't that true? Come on. Can we just give it up for our Lord and Savior? Hallelujah. Happy Father's Day. Oh, on that note, I woke up to a pretty cool card this morning. Um, in my illustration, you'll, you'll see a little bit about this later, but uh, food is a big part of my life. And so my wife got me this uh, uh, Father's Day card. I'm going to read it to you because... I thought, man, that's, that's too much right there. It says, uh, you're a supreme, a super supreme dad. And you open it up, and it's got a pizza in there. Anybody who knows anything about me goes, all right, I get it. I'm kind of a food addict. Can I say that? <laughs> it's just really good. And it's got some things in here. It says, um, you're the big cheese today. Okay, all right, makes sense. It says, there's not mushroom for improvement. I'm, okay, that's cute. Um, olive, you, lots and lots. You know, like, I love you. That's funny, right? Hold on one more. There's, there's, no, there's no topping you. Okay, that one, that was cheesy right there. But then this is my favorite one. I never sausage a great guy. <laughs> you know, like, I never saw such a guy. No, forget it. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. I'm going to keep that, though, and put it on my desk because I love it more than anything. Um, that, thank you, baby. And um, happy Father's Day to all of you out there. Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans 7, if you got them. Um, you can open up your, the YouVersion Bible app. We, we use the YouVersion Bible app so you can take notes a little bit. Um, but if you brought your paper Bible, man, you are kicking it old school, and we love you for that. Bust out that paper Bible. Turn to Romans 7. We're going to be mostly in Romans, and um, I believe this is going to have a, a tremendous impact on our lives. We're continuing a series in the book of Romans written by Paul. Um, the reason why we thought it was so crucial to share this this book right now because there's no better book in the entire Bible that outlines how to live a complete Christian life than the book of Romans. So we wanted to go through Romans because we want, us, we want to all live a good, solid life. We want to have a good life. And so we want the Bible to speak into that. Amen. We want the Bible to speak into the way we live our lives. So what better book than to walk through than Romans for this kind of summer series? I'm willing to bet that in this room and everyone listening online, that there's something you wish you did this week but didn't do. You don't have to raise your hands. It's all good. I didn't ask you to do that. You don't got to do that. Something you wish you did but you didn't do. Something like, I don't know, exercise? It's hot out there, man. I can't go to the gym. It's too hot. How about uh, being generous with your finances? You know, you were walking by somebody or maybe there was somebody with something. They needed something. You were like, oh, maybe, but oh, no. And now you're looking back going, oh, I wish I would have done that. How about something like praying for someone? You, they, you had them on your mind, but then you didn't follow through. Something, something that you wish you would have done but didn't do. Here's a better question, an even more tense question. I'll bet there's something that you wish you didn't do, but you did anyways. Ooh, that one's way more harsh. We don't like that one at all, do we? But let's talk life. Let's talk real life. Something this week, just this, just this week. Not in your whole life. I got some stories about whole life mistakes, stuff I wish I didn't do. 
But let's just stick with this week. Something you wish you, you didn't do, but you did anyways. Maybe something like scream at your kids. You don't have, you don't have to raise your hands, you know. You know, you just, it's church, you know. You, you're all perfect. I get it. You're all perfect. Everyone asked you how you're doing this morning, and you said, fine. Didn't you? I know you did. It's all good. How about something you, uh, you wish you didn't do, but didn't we, like, uh, talk behind someone's back? Talk about someone in such a way, and they weren't, they weren't there, so that was like some gossip or something. Maybe lied. Maybe you told a lie, and you're looking back, and I wish I wouldn't have done that, but you did it. Here's the thing. Uh, we all do this. We all do stuff like this all the time. Why is it, this is my question, why is it so hard to do the things we know we should do and so hard not to do the things we know we shouldn't do? What? is going on like with this? Am I the only one who feels this? Am I the only one that looks back in my week, in my life, and says, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Man, I wish I would have done this. And you look back on yourself and you're like, why? I can see so clearly how that is the right thing to do, but I didn't do it. I can see so clearly how that was not the right thing to do, but I did it anyways. Why? What is going on with that? Book of Romans, man. Book of Romans is so good about this in chapter in chapter 7. But before we get there, I got I to gotta just level the playing field a little bit. I got to tell you the, the truth about me. About two weeks ago, we went on a vacation in Nashville. You know, and I, I shared this with some, of my, with some of my personal team. I said, hey, pray for me. Because every time I go on vacation, man, I get out of my routine. I get out of my schedule. And it's really hard to come back. It's, it's just something I, I know it's there. I know I'm going to have to deal with it. But when I get out of town and I get out of my routine and my structure, I'm kind of like got something wrong with my brain, I guess. I'm like OCD or kind of like high-functioning something or other. I don't know what I am, but I know this. I have an issue with that. And so I told my team to even pray for me. And sure enough, I went on vacation. And I started to lose my routine. I started to lose my focus. And there were... There was a chunk of days where I didn't even read my Bible. Now, I know that doesn't sound like probably a big deal to a lot of you, but for me, it was a huge deal. Because when I stopped reading my that me, basically means I, I missed several days of quiet time with Jesus, like, in a row. And it doesn't take very, very many days for a guy like me for that to really have an effect on me. And it affected my mind and affected my life. And my flesh began to get louder and louder. And my spirit, my, the things I know I should, those started to get quieter and quieter. Let me just tell you, this happens to all of us. That was two weeks ago. Man, I'm still like getting back in the groove. We all deal with this. We all struggle with this. So I, I told that story just to let you know it's not just you. I'm not here to like fix you. I'm here to talk about something that we all struggle with, something we all deal with. And, and I just, I wanted to be honest with you. I don't know, is that all right today in church to, for the preacher to be like right there with you? Right there with you. I'm right there with you. Why is it so easy to let the bad habits rise? Why? Why is it so easy and so difficult to stay living the way we want to be living? Man, if we just wrote it down, we could write down the exact thing we want to do with our lives, but playing it out, living it out is so hard. Why is that? Did you know the most prolific Bible writer struggled with this very issue? A man named Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote the book of Romans, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, struggled with this specifically, and wrote about it specifically. Is that discouraging or encouraging? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. It's like, man, if he couldn't do it, what chance do I have? Or, man, if he dealt with it, that must make me Not so. Maybe I'm normal. Maybe there actually is hope for me. That's what I want you to feel. The most prolific Bible writer struggled with this very issue, and that's actually reassuring. Because if he dealt with it and wrote about it, that means we have something to go to. That's a good thing. Romans 7 and 8 is a perfect picture of what you and I deal with on a regular basis. So let's start right there. Let's listen to what this man Paul has to say, what he wrote to that church in Rome called the book of Romans, starting in Romans 7, 14. So the trouble is not with the law. So he's been, he's been talking for seven chapters about how the law can't save you, how obeying the law can't save you in and of itself. Can't save. The trouble is not with the law, but it ain't a bad thing. The trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The law is good. 
Obeying God's laws, good. <laughs> good thing. You had to come all the way to church to hear that. God's laws are good. Awesome. The trouble's with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. What? Paul, you can't, you can't say that. We're in church. You can't say that, Paul. What are you talking about? No, shh, shh, Paul. What you really meant to say was you used to be a slave to sin. That's not what he wrote. He wrote it, and it's never going away. Never. It's always going to be there. I mean, he wrote it in Greek, but it's just translated. It said the same thing, all right? I got news for you. They did a really good job when they translated the Bible. Really good. Really good. I'm all too human, a slave to sin. Verse 15, I really don't understand myself. Can anyone relate with that statement? I really don't even understand. Why? Why do I do this? Why am I thinking this way? Why am I acting this way? I don't even understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Can you believe this is written in the Bible by somebody? Can you believe it? I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I, I actively do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good, so I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does wrong. That sounds like a major cop-out to me. Oh, it wasn't me. It, wa- it wasn't me that did it, officer. It was the sin in me. <laughs> do you think, how do you think that would go? It's like me robbing a bank. I'm going to go over to F&M right down the street here. How about that bank called Rob-A-Bank? Anyone heard that bank called Rob-A-Bank? I learned that's the dumbest name for a bank ever. And maybe not the way you pronounce it, but whenever I look at them, I'm like, Rob-A-Bank? Are you testing me? Rob-A-Bank. It's like me robbing a bank, getting arrested, and saying, officer, no, it's, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Got a bag of money. I got a bag with like a money symbol on it, you know, and the bandana on. Oh, oh, officer, it wasn't me. It was the sin in me. You going to jail, boy. You going to jail for a really long time. But it sounds like a major cop out to me. I don't know about you, but Paul, what are you talking about? That sounds kind of ridiculous. But it's like that. It, it really does feel that way, doesn't it? It's like, I, I wasn't even the one who wanted to do that. There was something inside of me that did that. <laughs> I'm still thinking about that. But it's true. We always look back at our worst mistakes and be like, what happened there? What? What? What happened there? What little gobliny gook inside of me, what little devil on my shoulder told me? It wasn't even me, it feels like. There's something in us that urges us to do the things we know we shouldn't do. Let's read on. This preach is real good. Verse 21, I have discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably, everybody say inevitably. Inevitably. That was a fun word to make you say. (laughs) Inevitably do what's wrong. That means it's like I can't miss. When I know it's the right thing to do, I just do the wrong thing. No problem. Got you. Let me know the right thing to do. I'll miss it. I'll miss the mark. God, just write it out on Ten Commandments. I'll get it. Nope. Can't do it. I inevitably do what's wrong. Verse 22, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. There's another power within me that's at war with my mind. Now we're getting close to home. Now it's starting to get a picture of what's going on here. It's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. This is a Bible writing apostle, a a Bible writing church planting pastor said that there is sin that still with, that is still within me. There's hope for us, everybody. (laughs) There is hope for us. Amen. There is hope for us. He says this in verse 24. Oh, what a miserable person I am. (laughs) You ever sang that song to yourself? Oh, what a miserable person I am after I ate the last bit of ice cream, and my wife didn't get any. What a miserable person I am. It's Father's Day. I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> what a miserable person. I- Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? So far, I'm willing to bet that many of us, whether we're able to admit it publicly or not, we feel like this. We feel this way. You don't have to admit it. It's all good. I'm, I'm just willing to bet that maybe you do feel this way and that there actually is hope, but there's an answer that I'm going to get to really soon. I know, that what I, I know what I should do, but I can't do it. I know what I shouldn't do, but I do it anyways. What in the world am I supposed to do about this? 
But right there, that's the problem right there. It's not what we should do different. The answer is who we should go to outside of ourselves to get free. Verse 25, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Right here is where it gets really interesting because Paul changes gears a little bit. And we go, into verse, we go into chapter 8, but when he was writing, he didn't stop and write an 8 or anything like that. He was just writing, 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 writing. Later, we came in and said, oh, this is a new chapter, chapter 8. And we added verses later. We added chapters later. But just think of this as a continued thought. Think of this as a continued thought in Romans 8, starting in verse 1. It's just a continued thought. It says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen right there? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, that sounds like he may have overstated things a bit. No condemnation at all? Are you sure? Because you don't, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. Some of y'all are new at this church. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the stuff I've been through. You don't know the things I've seen or the things I've done. Lord, you must not know exactly what I've done to say that there's no condemnation. That doesn't seem right to me. But he says it, and it'll never go away. This will always be our Bible. This is always what he said. And the Holy Spirit locked this in for life. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, I'm going to say Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul is like any other good preacher. Paul's a good preacher, and he's like any other good preacher. He puts theology up front, and then he puts the application in the back. He puts theology up front, and he puts the application in the back. He follows it up with applications. He does this in his writings all the time, but also like a good preacher, he says, what he could have said in a few verses in a whole page. <laughs> That's like a good preacher right there, man. I could have been to the point and been done already. Happy Father's Day. You're out of here way early. <laughs> what kind of Father's Day gift is that right there? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's all there for good reason. It's all there for good reason. But I want to summarize what the answer is. Because chapter 8, um, if, you've been, if you've been at church any length of time, maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've never even been to church, but you've heard that. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And you've heard it just like that. But what a lot of us don't know is what in that whole chapter, there's a theme that he begins to break down the answer. Like how? In chapter 7, it was the war. It's I'm struggling with myself. I'm struggling in my mind. I can't help but do what's wrong. And then in chapter 8, he gives us the answer of how he conquers this sin urge inside of him. So I want to summarize it for you. I picked what I thought were the best verses to summarize, starting in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh, say flesh, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the is life and peace. There's a war going on, and there's two words that keep going back and forth, back and forth, back, back and forth, spirit and flesh. We talked about last week how the flesh simply means the sin nature that we have. It's like my skin. You know, I was born with it. It's the part of me. You know, I'm a mind. I'm also a soul. I have emotions, but I also have skin. I also have a tummy, and I also have a brain, and I also wake up sometimes and want to eat ice cream, and I don't want to exercise, and I, you know, that's our flesh. That's our nature, the stuff that it just feed me. I want to be happy all the time. I want to binge watch Netflix and eat nom, 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 Otter Pops all night long. Ah, that's your flesh talking. Did I hit way close to home just now for some of you? Some of you are like, how did he know? How He was watching me last night. No, I was not. I was not. There, <laughs> there seems to be a face-off happening between the spirit and the flesh, and the battlefield is the mind. There's a face-off happening between the spirit and the flesh, and the battlefield is the mind. Paul makes this grand statement. There is no condemnation. Then he gives us the answer. Uh, do, we have that, do we have that picture of that thing? This is a picture of my notes. It's probably hard to see from right here, but this is a picture of my desktop. 
and I was studying this passage out for you, and I decided to circle every time the word spirit was used and every time the word flesh was used. There's a lot of circles there, isn't there? Squares. They are. They are squares. I got it. I got it. Like I said, OCD. Like, a circle is too round. It needs to be, uh, uh, ah, I need lines in my life. It needs to be straight. Uh. That's just the way I like it. Even my highlighting is like so edgy. I like that. The word spirit in these 14 verses, so like stopped right there. Actually stopped. I can't. I'd fall. But this is verse 14 right there. In the 14 verses of chapter 8, the word spirit is used 16 times. So he just said there, there is a war going on. And I feel like I'm losing. But then, like I told you, he comes with the, the, the answer afterward. What's the answer? Life in the spirit. There's another word he uses a lot, flesh, 12 times in 14. Anytime you're reading your Bible, if you're a Bible reader at home, if you notice a word gets used over and over and over and over again, it's like, Paul, would you please use a different word? Nope, I used the word I wanted to use. The, the word flesh was used 12 times. The word spirit was used 16 times. The answer, the answer to that question, how, how do I win this war, is life in the spirit, being led by the spirit. The verse, verse 13 sums it up like this. Let's change it to verse 13 so we can look at this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. See, he could have just said that at the beginning. <laughs> if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, by the Spirit you put to death. That's an action that we can take. Finally. Don't you love applications? Don't you love action steps that we can take to make a difference in our lives? I do. I love that. By the Spirit you can put to death the misdeeds of the body. You will live. You can put to death the misdeeds. For the, verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. If you are led by the Spirit of God, then there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's something I want you to remember. For the rest of your life, hopefully at least for the rest of the day, the key to living free is inviting the Spirit to live in me. I want to talk to you today about living a spirit-led life, what that really means. Let me say that again and write this in your notes. I think it might be in there. The key to living free. If it's not in there, write it down anyways. There's pins everywhere. The key to living free is inviting the spirit to live in me. And if not led by the spirit, there is another leader who is eager to take charge right here, right here. And it's got lots of ideas. It will keep you busy. In the worst possible way. In order to get the freedom you want in life, you have to trade leaders. You have to trade leaders. What's going to lead us? Is it going to be our flesh? Is it going to be our desires? Is it going to be our wants? Or are we going to choose to be led by the Spirit? And some, some of us may have heard that term and just, it's too out there. You know, it's too, spirit. oh, just be led by the Spirit like it's a cartoon. You know, there's a little, there's a little draft of smell and then the cat goes goes floating through being led by the spirit you kind of just floating around no it's actually very it's very practical being led by the spirit is very practical and it's like literal action steps you can take every day to choose to be led by the spirit and this is actually exactly the things that I've been doing to get myself back on track when my when my flesh begins to take over a little bit these are the things that I do to make sure I'm being led by the Spirit and make sure the Spirit of God is living in me and I'm being led by the Spirit. Let me, how can I explain this to you? When I got married, I invited Tiffany to live with me. Is everyone getting that picture? I, when I got married, there was a major change that happened in my life and I invited Tiffany to live with me. Don't worry, hon, it's gonna be all right. I'm not gonna say any story. It's gonna be great. This is gonna be okay. It was a major commitment on my part. To invite someone to live with you is a major commitment and blessing <laughs> and blessing. But there were a lot of changes that were necessary in my life that had to happen if I wanted her to live with me successfully and for her to live in my life. The layout of my apartment needed to change. 
I had to make room for her stuff. You know, I, I couldn't have my apartment set up the way that it was before if she was going to want to live with me. That's the way to say it. My furniture changed. Instead of having like one fold-out chair in the middle of the living room, nobody. You're like, no, that wasn't me. It was me. I had to, I had to get myself ready. I had to put a love seat in there. I had to put a couch in there. I had to put a little area rug in there with a coffee table. I had to change some things in my life. Are you seeing this? I had to change some things in my life if I wanted Tiffany to live with me. My schedule had to change because I don't just get off work and then go gallivanting around town doing whatever I want like when I was single. No, I come home after work. Why? Because I have someone who loves me who's waiting for me. Some, thi some things have to change if you want someone to live with you. Are, you. are you getting this? Are you seeing this? Some things have to change. My bedtime changed. <laughs> that was a major change right there. Because when we got married, Tiffany waked up at, at 3 a.m. Oh, yeah. Was it 2? It was 3. It was Starbucks opening shift. Enough said right there. And so my bedtime had to change. If I wanted to, to go to bed on time, away, you know, my schedule had to change. Uh, my workload changed. There was a new chore distribution. And it didn't get, it didn't get, uh, Heavier, actually. Thank you, hon, for that. The biggest change, the biggest change that I ex that I experienced were my eating habits. Uh, exhibit A. Let me tell you about my eating habits before I got married. This is really embarrassing. Can you guys see that over here? Let me move this right up front. These are my eating habits. Oh yeah, right there. Let's start off with this bad boy. Just add water pancakes. Okay, this is this is like the go-to right here. All you got to do is add water. Come on, man. It is easy to go. You know, don't ride in a car with me after a plate full of those. All I'm saying is they're easy and they're cheap. $10 for this bag. And I, I didn't have to go to the store to buy this bag. This is still in my house. Come on, somebody. Just add water pancakes. And then let's not forget Mr. Can of 50 Cent Chili. Okay? I get down with my bachelor self. Before I met Tiffany, my eating habits were very poor. But a 50 Cent can of chili ain't no good without the craft, macaroni and cheese, man. These two bad boys together, I'm good for a week. Man, give me like seven bucks, I'm eating good. I'm eating real good. But you know, you can't, you can't dumb it down to the off-brand, okay? You got to get craft. Or I may have been a bachelor and I made it, I may have eaten badly, but I still got craft. If I, if I got the microphone, you gotta listen to me. For, craft is better, all right? But you gotta wash it down with something so how about a whole bag of Otter Pops? All right, I go through one of these. I go through one of these. Give me four days. I eat like 10 of these in a sitting. I go through them quick. And this, okay, another tip. If anybody's single up in here, you ain't celebrating Father's Day just yet. Any single boys over here, man, this off-brand right here is like half the price, double the quantity. Come on, get you some of that. It's summertime. <laughs> it's summertime, man. It's time to get, it's time to get down, man. I got a quick story about this one time. So, so actually, this actually happened. Um, me and Tiffany are married for several years, and she goes away to women's camp. Come on, come on, give a hoorah for women's camp up in here. Who's been to women's camp up in here? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, like some of you. Great. Um, she goes away to women's camp. I'm like not cheering for women's camp because every time women's camp comes along, I am alone. <laughs> And it is hard. Come on. Come on, boys. Where you at? It is hard. One year, this is back when we lived on Cherry Street. This is our first home, and it was, it was cool. She was going away for a couple days. She was gone for two days solid. She's like, all right, honey, you got, you got like $20, $30. Okay, you got to take care of yourself, though. Okay, because, you know, I'm good at some things, and I'm just not good at other things. Okay? She comes home on a Sunday afternoon to find pizza boxes everywhere. I am a pastor at this point, and there are pizza boxes everywhere and Otter Pop wrappers all over the house. I had eaten nothing but pizza and Otter Pops for two days solid. I'm on the couch. She comes home. I'm like, honey, my stomach hurts. My tummy hurts. Tiffany, she's like, well, did you eat any vegetables? No. <laughs> I didn't know. You weren't here. Come on, man, where are you at? Am I the only one? Let me, let me just explain this to you. This is funny, but 
It, it doesn't take much for our flesh to want to come back and those old habits want to come back. And that, that person, the Holy Spirit is a person. That person we invited to live with us, in us, to get snuffed out by the desires of the flesh. To get snuffed out by the desires of the flesh. If the key to living free is inviting the Spirit to live in me, then how do we do that? It's a lot like a marriage, you know that? When we give our lives to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I give you everything. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for what you did on the cross. I, I want to give you my life. It's a lot like when you stand at the altar with, with your spouse and say, I give you my life. We are now one. So when we, we come into that union with God and say, God, I'm, I'm yours, that doesn't mean we never make mistakes. It means we have someone that's in relationship with us. And we give room for that relationship to take priority. It's a lot like a marriage. It really is. It's a lot like a marriage. So let's talk about action steps that we can take to keep the Holy Spirit living in us, with us, guiding our every move. This is number one. I want you to remember this. Number one is proactive daily invitation. Write this down, daily devotion. Write it down somewhere. Write it on your notes. Write it somewhere. Daily devotion. Daily devotion is a way that we keep the Holy Spirit living in us, with us. Daily devotion. It's proactive. It's daily. It's regular. It's consistent. It just happens every single day. Listen to what, listen to what Ephesians 5 says. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but listen to this. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Remember that little statement. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine. That will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your heart. Verse 20, and give thanks for everything to God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. There was just three things. In that passage of Scripture, those five verses, there was three things that we're being told to do every single day to keep the Spirit at the forefront in our life. Number one, read the Bible. What did it say in verse 17? Understand what the Lord wants you to do. There's no better way than to be in your Bible every single day. There's no better way. So being led by the Spirit, a part of that is translated stay in your word on a regular basis daily. Another part of that is make the part that says make music to the Lord. Listen to worship music every day. At least one song. The, the verse is telling us how to do it. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Making music to the Lord in your heart. So that can mean listening to that and letting that happen to you. Part, this is letting the Spirit have place in your life. And finally, give thanks for everything to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in verse 20, that means taking time to pray daily. So what just happened? Daily, if we want to make a daily proactive step, take daily proactive steps to be led by the Spirit and win that war against the flesh, read the Bible every day, listen to some worship music every day, and pray every day. One, two, three. It's so easy. It sounds easy, but like I said, it's, it's not always easy. It's something we need to remind ourselves of all the time. It's why I bring it up a lot, because it's so important. It's because I want you to be successful in life. I don't want you to have regrets. I don't want you to do the things that you, do, you know you don't want to do. And so I want to give you the keys. I want to give you the answer. We call it the first 15 around here. Uh, my wife just started doing it with our own kids. You know, our kids are two and three years old, but we started doing this because it, we know how important it is. The first 15 means five minutes in the Bible. It's like a chapter. Five minutes with a worship song. It's one song, typically. Uh, one chapter, one song, and five minutes of prayer. And I, I tell my guys that, that I work with a lot, I tell them like this, you know, spend five minutes, spend the first two minutes thanking God for everything you could think of. You know, prayer is easy. You know, take, take this example. Just thank him for two minutes. It goes by quick. Just thank him for everything. Thank you that I slept in a bed last night. Thank you for a roof over my head. Thank you that I have a car to drive, even though it's a hoopty. <gasps> thank you for everything that, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Two minutes. And then after that, the next two and a half minutes, let God know everything you need. Let God, God, you know, I could really use help with this. I could really use help with that. I could, God, I could use your support on this. Five minutes goes by really quick. It's something that every single one of us can do every single day. You may not have an hour for your daily devotions, but you definitely have 15 minutes. 
definitely have 15 minutes, daily proactive steps to be led by the Spirit and to win this war in the mind, the Spirit versus the flesh. We want the Spirit to win. Let's talk about number two here. Um, stopping in the moment. In the moment invitation of the Holy Spirit. Write this down somewhere. Stop and pray. Because sometimes in your lives, things get so heavy, things get so hard in that moment that it's not about daily devotion right then. It's about, I need some Jesus right now. <laughs> I need some help right this second. I, I need, I, God, I need you. And this step, I want you to always remember, when things are getting tough, just stop and pray. Just stop right in the middle of what you're doing and pray. And stop. Oh, God, I need you. Listen to Philippians 6 and 7, 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Remember how I told you to pray? Tell God what you need and thank him for what, thank him and tell him what you need. Thank him and tell him what, you, prayer is easy. Thank him, tell him what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Maybe this is a little bit about what Paul was talking about in Romans 8. You're going to experience God's peace in your mind. If you learn to do this, which exceeds anything we can understand, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. There are times when things suddenly come and weigh us down. I mean, we've all been through that. There are things just come up in our lives, and they, they happen all the time. Man, this thing, it's pressing me down. It's weighing me down. In those moments when you find yourself worried, it is crucial that we invite the Spirit into our lives by thanking him for all he has done, and telling him about everything we need, not because he doesn't already know, but because that's how you invite the Spirit to live in you. You're inviting the Spirit into that moment, knowing, okay, Romans 8, I know how to beat this. I have to invite the Spirit. Pastor Elliot told me, oh, it was 16 times that he said the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit in Romans 8 about how to beat the flesh, about how to go through those hard times. I need to invite the Spirit in me. Stop and pray. Stop and talk to him. You will be amazed of what kind of peace and relief that brings in your life when you just can learn to stop and pray. Stop and go for a walk. Stop and go for a drive. Stop in the middle of that argument. Stop in the middle of that issue that's coming up again. Stop before you respond. Stop and invite the spirit to live in you by praying and, and giving him permission to guide you instead of letting your flesh guide you. Because your flesh is always there going, oh, I got that. <laughs> your flesh is always there to say, oh, I got a solution for that. Oh, yeah. And it's always one of those things that you wish you didn't do. Always, always. Number three, last one. Uh, 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 something that we can do to invite the Spirit to, to guide us, to be led by the Spirit. Number three, big step invitations. Getting away. Getting away. Now, this is one of my least favorites. <laughs> I like staycations. I, we already talked about this. I like staycations. I really do. But we all need to get away sometimes in order to invite the Spirit to speak to us in a new and fresh way. This is higher level stuff right here. This is another way of saying this is like a higher dose of, of the Holy Spirit to live in our lives and to, to invite the Spirit into us in a new, a bigger way, a higher dose way. If you've never done this, you might not know what you're missing. Listen to what the Bible says about it in, in Luke 5.16. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Often. He often withdrew. He, if Jesus needed to get away to let the Spirit lead him and guide him. Oh, some of you said, oh, it wasn't to let the Spirit guide him. Hold up a second. Next chapter, Luke 6. One day, soon afterward, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray, and he prayed all night long. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Check out, check what Jesus did, just did. He, he got away, had, a, had a, a little getaway, a little spirit speak to me getaway, and that's how he chose his 12 apostles. That's crazy. That's crazy. How much more should we be, be getting away and taking times of prayer, times of, of retreat to say, Lord, speak to me about a major decision I'm about to make. These people walked with him for three years, and they were all chosen specifically, even Judas, the one who betrayed him. If Judas wasn't there, we wouldn't have the gospel. They, 
that needed to be exactly that way. And Jesus seemed to think that getting away to let God speak to him was exactly what was needed in that moment to get the right insight to make the right call. Check out these ways that I just, I, I've spelled out a couple different ways that we can do that. Number one, uh, camps. You know, we have men's camps, women's camps, youth camps. We have our own camp. Did you know that? We have our own campground. Foursquare owns a campground in Sonora. And we send men there. We send women there. We send people there. And these are like special moments where, you know, we pony up the dough. Men, women, whoever's going, we pony up the dough to say, I'm getting away to get a higher dose of the Holy Spirit in my life. I am choosing to, to not work. I'm choosing to get the time off. I'm choosing to pay money so that it's not just to eat barbecue. You can do that at home. You know, we can do these things. It's not to shoot paintball. We can do that anytime. No, we go because we know that from these mountaintop experiences, we can make decisions that will impact our life for years, just like Jesus. Exactly the same thing that happened with Jesus. Camps is one way. You know, we also have a little closer to home ways that you can do this. Worship nights. We have worship nights every three months. It's like an hour, hour and 15 minutes. It's like a service like this, but at night and mostly music where you can just come and say, all right, Pastor Elliot said that if I invite you in, that you're going to guide me and lead me somehow. He will. He will. We have those kind of nights. I think there's one coming up in about a month. On the 10th of July. On the 10th of July. Mark your calendars. It's a way to invite the Holy Spirit to live in your life in a, in a higher dose way. So like reading your Bible in the morning, that's one way. But you can also come to these nights and say, you know what? No, I'm taking this like a mountaintop experience. I'm doing what Jesus did. I'm getting away from my normal routine to hear you, Lord, to hear something. Because I want to be led by the Spirit, not the flesh. It all comes from a desire of being want to be led by the Spirit, not the flesh. Romans 8. Never forget that. There's no condemnation, but it's a war between your spirit, between the Spirit and the flesh. And there are actual ways to let the Spirit win in your mind. And worship nights are one of them. There's another way. Um, you know, Starting when life groups start, life groups are about to launch. Man, we got so many life groups. We got life groups for everybody, men, women, couples, kids, everybody. There's life groups for everybody. Please sign up for one. But there's a life group starting. It's a prayer group. We meet right here on Wednesday nights every single week. We turn up the iPod, and we're like scattered around all here. We let the music play, and we just listen for God. That's all we do. We, we, we tell God everything we need. We thank him for all he's done. We gather together, do a little devotional, like at the beginning and the end. It's pretty simple. You just show it, and it's a higher dose way to let the Spirit lead your life. Man, you don't even have to come to that every single week. You can just come every once in a while and be like, man, my flesh is winning. Let's give the Spirit an advantage here. <laughs> Let's go spend some quiet time with him. Does it, this isn't too otherworldly, is it? I hope this is very practical for you. I hope this is stuff that you can do in your daily life. I hope this is stuff that can really help you win this war, really help you win this war between the flesh and the spirit. Man, Jesus won the war. He won it. He gave himself to be a sacrifice for our sins, but check it out. We ain't in heaven yet. We ain't in heaven yet. Excuse me, when I get real, uh, when I get real passionate, I get a little slang. We ain't in heaven yet. I was listening to a song on the way over here. I always listen to music when I'm on my way to church, and it was some glad morning. When the life is over, I love that song a lot. You're going to hear it from me a lot. But it, it made me remember. Because so, I'm going through a lot of stuff, too, just like everyone else. I'm like, man, someday, <laughs> someday I'm going to be in a place where joy never ends. Until then, now I'm, I'm fighting this fight just like everyone else, man. And I want to be ready. I want to be, I want to be on my game. I wanna, that means I need to be in my word every day. I want to be praying every day. I want to I wanna go to these camps. I want to take these opportunities to get away any chance I can to let the Spirit win in my life. Remember, in order to get this freedom you want in your life, you have to trade leaders. You have to let the Holy Spirit lead your life instead of you. Like, let him actually lead it. It's going to bless you. It's going to bless you so much. You have to trade your flesh for spiritual control. 
And if you want that, it is as simple as incorporating these elements into your life. In order to stop doing the things you don't want to do and start doing the things that you know are right, you have to give the spirit control of your life. The key to living free is inviting the spirit to live in me. Can you all remember that? The key to living. Does anybody want to live free today? Anybody want to live free in their life? The key to it. The key to living free. Romans 7 and 8. This man dealt with it, struggled with it, fought for it. The key to living free is inviting the Spirit to live in me and giving him first place in my life. What would, our, what would your life look like? How would your life be different? Look back on the last several months of your life. How would your life possibly have been different if you had been doing some of these things? Would it be any different, you, you suppose? What would the next three months of your life look like if you started just incorporating these, these items? Verse 15. I'm going to come to a prayer night. I'm going to come to a worship night. H how could your life be different? How many less regrets might you have? How much more power would there be in your prayers, in your life, in your family, in your work? You know, I, I heard a really great um, illustration of, of, of blessing um, or, to be quite honest, curse, cursing. You know, another, another way that to describe a curse isn't necessarily something bad happening to you. Maybe it's something good being held back from you. So we, we could be under a curse. And it's not necessarily that anything bad is even happening to you. But there's something really good that's on the other side of your obedience that's just waiting, just waiting for you to, for you to show up, for you to just put God first in your life. For you to say, all right, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to step forward. Man, I know that's a little strong. <laughs> Tell you, y'all, curse. You ain't curse. I'm just saying. What, what might be different if we started putting him the first thing in the morning in our life? I started showing up. How could our life be more powerful? What might be just around the bend for us if we decide to do that? What blessing might get poured out on our life if we decided to put him first? Let me just tell you, Jesus put us first. He put us first. That's why we tell the dream team every single week, hey, today, next couple hours, dream team, when we're showing up on Sunday morning, not about us. Why? Because Jesus showed up saying, it's not about me. It's about you. That's a picture of what we are all designed to do as, as believers of Christ. We put others before ourselves. We want to put the Holy Spirit before ourselves. We want to put him first in our life. Jesus gave it all so that we could have it all. I want the end of this teetering back and forth between, between living in our flesh and living in the spirit, between living a healthy life and living off of junk food. And I know what it's like to live on junk food. In the moment, you're like, oh, good. But every single night and every single day, you're like, man, I'm just not, I don't feel good. And spiritually, is no different. We can just be like cruising in life, being like, ah, oh, something's missing. Something's not right. I'm missing out on something. There's something like you're saved. You are going to heaven when you die. But there's something on the other side of putting the Holy Spirit first, of putting God first. There's a blessing waiting for you. There's a blessing waiting for you. And people of God and, and anybody listening who's on the fence uh, to say, I haven't even given my life to Jesus. I would encourage you, take a chance. Take a chance on Jesus. Take a chance. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And those of you who do call yourself you know, believers and I, I follow Christ, you don't have anything to lose by, by giving a, a higher measure of him in your daily life. I hope this is a blessing to you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we begin to close here. Because I just have a, a feeling in my heart, as I do every single week, that there might be some of us who are ready to make a decision, that are ready to make a choice to say, I haven't been living the way I know I should be living. I've tried to live this thing my own way. I've tried to live my own life. I've tried to make my own decisions. And God knows it just hasn't been working. It just hasn't been working. And there are some of you here today 
that you, you are saved, you are believers, but you just know you're, you're not where you should be with God. You're not where you should be with God. And today, like we do every single week, I want to give an opportunity to every single man, woman, and child in this place with heads down and eyes closed. This is a private moment between you and God to say, God, I give you everything. I'm going to give you my whole life. I'm going to give you my whole heart. I'm going to give you my whole, my mind, my will, my emotions, my body. No more junk food, God. No more living off of my flesh. God, I'm living for you. I'm taking the plunge. God, I'm all yours. If I described you in any way, shape, or form today, if you're far from God and know you want to be closer to him, or if you used to be close to him and want to be even closer and want to recommit your life to him, anybody who wants to give their life to Jesus today, I encourage you right now in this holy moment to lift your hand to God. Go ahead, do it right now. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Hallelujah, go ahead, leave it up. Leave it up high. Go ahead, be bold in this moment. Amen, yes, right there. Amen. Amen, men. There are men raising their hands today. You can put your hands down. Let's pray this prayer like we've never prayed it before in a new way. So just say it right after me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give my life to you. I give you my mistakes. I give you my triumphs. I give you my flesh. Take control. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. Fill me with your spirit and show me the way to go. Amen. Amen. Can we clap our hands for everybody who made it?